Hi, um, I'm going to talk to you about isn't a time we started to ignore the rule book, but before I do that, I just wanted to share that I'm very, very lucky. I worked at a rural primary school for 12 years and halfway through last year I actually picked up a job at Melton Primary School, which happens to have the coolest job title, I think, in Victoria for educators. I'm actually a leading teacher of Innovative Learning Design and ICT, which is a really cool title. And the reason I've got the picture of the Lego man up here is because there's a bit of a theme of Lego going through my presentation. And he kind of looks a bit like me, follows the same sorts of themes as me. And I know, just to help out, I know there's a few South Australians in here and you don't pronounce it the same as us, so when I say Lego, just remember Lego, okay? <laughs> so, isn't it time we start to ignore the rule book? Now, when I mention rule book, the rule book in education can mean any number of things. We've got policies, we've got all the different things that we have to follow just to get through the day, OH&S and all those other different things, but I'm thinking of something that relates to the C word, that dirty, dreaded C word that scares teachers and just keeps them awake at night. It's the curriculum, okay? The Australian curriculum that is coming out that we have to abide by and sometimes we just, it's treated too much as a rule book. But when you look at, when you look deeply at the introduction on the website, there's a couple of little hints there to uh, guide us. Nowhere does it say must. Okay, it says that we, that students should be taught. Okay, we don't have to be restricted. And the key line is down the bottom. Okay, where it talks about students and our teachers and schools are responsible for the organisation and planning of education that suits the needs and interests of the child. Okay, we don't have to do everything that it says in the order that it says. I don't want to be the teacher that tells a grade two kid that comes up to me and says, Mr. G, why does the, sun, uh, the earth revolve around the sun? I don't want to say to him, sorry, mate, you don't learn about that just yet. You've got to wait. But I, I hear teachers say that. I hear teachers in planning and in discussions, we don't, do, we don't teach that yet. They'll learn about that later on. But we're robbing kids of the things that they want to know. Also talking curriculum, I want to tell you something that uh, you can go back to school on Monday, strike fear into the eyes of a lot of staff members in your staff room, send everyone quivering. Three simple words. It might even, I hope it doesn't scare anyone here, but it might. Digital technologies curriculum. <laughs> it is coming, it is coming fast. The smart schools, the ready schools, they are doing it now. They have jumped in. There are schools that are waiting back that are going to get to it when they have to teach it and they're not going to know what, they, what they're doing. When you talk to staff members about it, these are the questions that you hear. What is that? What does that mean? Coding? I don't know what coding is. How can I teach that? And then the big one. How do I fit this into an already crowded curriculum? We know the curriculum is crowded. I've, I've read somewhere yesterday, actually, that if you taught everything in the grade three Australian curriculum, each progression point, one session a day, it would take you 18 months to cover it all. Yeah, it's crowded. That's why we need to think smart. That's why we need to make the curriculum a little less crowded. So what I want to do with you now is I want to flash back to 30 years ago, 1986. It was me, a little bit shorter, a lot skinnier, long blonde mullet, and this is where my passion and love of Lego started. Parents buying me sets for my birthday, ripping it open, going through the instructions, building it each set at a time. And when you're using stuff like Lego and you follow the instructions, you can come up with some amazing things. All right? They produce some amazing products. But then on my 10th birthday, 1990, something changed for me. I got a different Lego set. I got this set. This is the exact set that I got for my 10th birthday. I remember it like it was yesterday. And there was one thing that was different about this set to all the other ones that I had. It was a light and sound system. It blew my mind. My Lego that I had built could flash lights and flash sound. And all of a sudden I started thinking, my police car would look awesome with that. So I figured out, I don't have to follow the rule book anymore. 
I can take that off, I can put it on my police car and get my police car having flashing lights. The fire truck can have a siren. In the Lego world, when people are doing this sort of stuff, it's called a mock, okay, my own creation. And if we get rid of the instructions, you can create amazing things on yourself. The picture on the right hand side, that is a picture that the students at Meredith Primary School made when I gave them the brief of what would your dream school look like. They didn't have any instructions. These were the designs that they came up with and then they went away and built it. So when we get rid of the ideas of having to stick to what we're told to do, that is when we can do the really great things. So my question to you is what if we decided to mock our curriculum, not follow it to the letter of the law? At the moment, people say a lot of things about the curriculum. It is not a Bible. It is not a rule book. It is simply a guidebook. It is a guidebook for us to help us know what kids at a certain age should understand. And unfortunately, powers that be at the moment are pushing it down our throat that kids have to be here at this level. They have to be here. And quite often, not only is it the ones that are behind that get forgotten about, it's those that are ahead. Those kids that are ahead that are ready to go on and do great things and move forward in their, in their learning. They're in grade four, but they're capable of being in grade six. But because, as Ken Robinson said, they've got that date stamp on their head, we keep them where they are. So I want to talk to you about a project that I did two years ago called Mr G's Grades Lego Trek. And the story of how it started was we were doing animation in our classroom, using Lego a lot, obviously, using claymation, all those sorts of things, and the Lego movie was coming out. So one of those students who likes to interrupt and hear his voice being heard and be a bit of a smarty pants and all that sort of stuff, we were having a discussion, put his hand up, which was an achievement, putting his hand up, <laughs> and said, can we make our own Lego movie, Mr G? And started sniggering, and he got the shock of his life when I said, yeah, of course we can. But if we're going to do this, we're going to do it properly. We're not going to make a Lego movie just on the iPads in the classroom. We're going to make a Lego movie, and we're going to get it screened in the cinemas. And the kids all looked at me with shock. We can't do that. I said, of course we can. I didn't know if we could, <laughs> but that's beside the point. I said, of course we can. Why not? Why can't we? So we set, a, we set about a project and I said, they said to the kids, well, how long is it, the kids said to me, how long is it going to go for? We'll go for five minutes because when we, take, when we make the animations of our spelling words and contractions, we take 10 photos and it goes for two seconds. I said, well, let's see how close we can get to a feature length movie. Now, a feature length movie by definition starts at 40 minutes and up. So we, that was our target. We didn't quite get there. I'll talk, but our movie did go for 25 minutes, which is a massive achievement for, year, uh, for grade one, two students. All right? Seems a bit more impressive now, doesn't it? <laughs> So these kids, these six, seven, eight-year-old kids set about planning and figuring out what it was they wanted to do, how they wanted to do the movie, who was going to do what role. They all had to write written applications and letters to me about the role they wanted to do in the movie. We had students who were art directors. It looks amazing. It was painted by students. They were given guidance by a teacher aide in my room who was an amazing folk artist, but they did do it. They created a life-size Lego version of me. <laughs> if I stand next to that, it is the same height as me, and it is the same dimensions of a Lego minifigure. Okay? They used calculators to figure out the ratio difference of a leg of a minifigure is 1.2 centimetres, then the leg of the giant Mr G for it to be equivalent to 1.88, which is my height, needed to be 1.21 uh, 1 metres or something like that. That's pretty amazing for seven and eight year olds. Doesn't say that in the curriculum that they need to know that, but they were able to do it. I wasn't going to stop them from doing it 
because they didn't need to know it yet. So they created boxes. They built their own animation stages. They worked as teams <coughs> to create their own individual scenes within the 25 minute movie. And we got it screened in the number one, the main cinema in Ballarat, 700 seats, and we had about 230 people come and watch. One of the biggest achievements of it is we used zero budget at school. The kids raised their own funds. They wrote letters to companies asking for sponsorship. Not only did we pay for that, we also paid for a guest speaker to come and speak. You'll notice up the back next to me, Adam Elliott, Oscar winning animator who came to watch the kids do, uh, share their movie with people. He was amazed. He said it was the best student animation he had ever seen. He wanted us to enter it into animation competitions, but we couldn't because, and this is a side story, at the end of the movie there was a dance scene, because you know, all movies have dance scenes at the end of it, and the kids wanted to use the song Happy. And I said, look, I know you want to and it's great and it'd be awesome, but we can't because of copyright. So it was a chance to explain to seven and eight year olds what copyright, copyright was. And then they asked, well, how do they get used it in other movies? And I said, well, they write and ask permission and they pay a certain amount of money. Can we write and ask permission? I said, okay. So we did. I, I wrote this, I didn't leave this one on the kids. <laughs> so I wrote to the publisher and they gave us permission to use it in our movie. They didn't charge us a cent. But because of they did not charging us, we weren't allowed to use it for film festivals and things like that. So all of these opportunities happened because I didn't treat the curriculum like a Bible. I didn't treat it like a rule book. I treated it like a guidebook. And despite parents coming to me and saying, are you sure my kids are learning something? I had a list, a list of over 30 progression points across six curriculum areas that we were covering during our program. And I was able to, just by being observant and watching, I could see what kids were achieving what. I didn't have to teach an individual lesson about ratios because I'm not supposed to, it's not the curriculum for year, two, year one students. Okay, but I was able to see all the different things that they were doing and I was able to match my project to the curriculum. Instead of thinking curriculum first, what can we do? Please think of the big idea first and then find out how it fits. So jumping back to the digital technologies curriculum and our very, very crowded curriculum. What sort of things can we create that is going to allow us to fit the digital technologies curriculum into our classroom. Now, when you talk to people who are experts on digital technologies curriculum, they say, oh, it fits in with maths. No worries at all, you'll be able to fit it in easy. I want to think different. I don't want to just fit it in with maths because teachers might not want to. You've got to have different versions. So I'm going to show you a video next of how I was able to fit coding into literacy. Okay? And so just a bit of context, this was done over two hours, okay? It's a grade four student who happens to be my daughter, so I'm a little bit biased. And the way B-Bots work is there's a mat, you program the B-Bot physically by pressing arrows and buttons to make it move around the mat. Now, the intention was for the students to learn how to move the B-Bot around the mat. But to fit it into literacy, what they had to do is I had to write a story based on the map, okay? So after they wrote the story, we then programmed the Bebop. It moved around in accordance to the story and was recorded with an iPad, which was then imported into iMovie, and then they read their story out over it. So in two hours, they've covered reading, writing, digital technologies, ICT, all these different sorts of things in two hours. So hopefully it will play nicely for us. One more. 
morning, Bob the farmer was in his sheep pen feeding them grass, and all of a sudden, a sheep kicked open the gate. Oh no! They ran out! Let's go find them! So he walked to the lake. Found one, he said. He walked to his garden. Found another. He walked to his dog. Another. And he walked to his pig pen. Done, he said. He led them back to the pen. And made sure the gate was shut properly. He lived a fabulous life. The end. I had to whisper. She had a bit of trouble with her timing at the end, so I had to say, "Okay, say that bit now." <laughs> so, as you can see, and as a, we start to move towards the end, I just want to. Leave, there's so much available to us if we think outside the box. When you think outside the box, we've had people talk about what they remember from school when they were younger and things like that. It's the memories that the kids have in school that will come back. And if a memory comes back to you, you're going to remember all the stuff that led up to that memory. So if you're creating these amazing projects and these exciting things for them to do, they're going to remember how they got there and the steps they took to get there. So this is a chance. Be the opportunity maker for your students. Those grade one, two students, they had the opportunity to be filmmakers. How many people here can say that they've had a film screened at a real cinema in front of, 700, oh, in front of 250 people and an Academy Award winning animator? because I know 22 10-year-olds now that can. Okay, so the curriculum, it is a guidebook, not a rule book. We need to stop treating it as one. Thank you.